Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word out of thankfulness to God for giving us His Word. At the conclusion of the reading, I will say, this is the Word of the Lord, and we invite you to respond. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mer mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the, du will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This is the word of the Lord. Kingdom kids are now released to their classrooms. Well, good morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, as we always say at this point, my name is Pat. And I'm glad that you're here. If you're a first-time visitor and we've not met, um, I would be honored if you take the, uh, take the initiative to introduce yourself to me and uh, give us a chance to get to know you. We're in the middle of a series on psalms. It's our summer psalm. And as it would happen, um, the draw gave me another one of those psalms that has a title attached to it. And so you might recall a few weeks ago, we worked through that other psalm of David that had the title, Doe of the Dawn and then started off with, my God, my God, why have, I, why have you forsaken me? And we had to figure out, okay, what is the connection here? We didn't read it out loud today, but the title of this psalm is A Psalm of David, A Song at the Dedication of the Temple. So if we're going to understand what's going on in the psalm, we've got to figure out what's the connective tissue between the title of the psalm and what David says here. And... Um, that's the only way we're probably going to make sense of this today. So let's pray and ask for the Lord's help, and we'll, we'll dive in, okay? Our Father, we thank you for your word, that you have given your thoughts, your heart, your affections to us in language we can understand, that you have granted us to have in our possession books that contain your words. But we are still thick and dull and hard of understanding the brightest amongst us are not all that bright, and so we beg for your help. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, whose name we confessed just a few moments ago in the creed, that you would help us to understand your word, and even more, that you would help our hearts to be moved by it as David's heart was moved in this psalm. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I said, a big challenge this morning is figuring out the connection between the title of the psalm and what David actually says. Groundwork is pretty simple. When you build a temple, it's appropriate to dedicate that temple with some kind of pomp and circumstance. And so having poetry or songs or 
artistic expressions designed expressly for the dedication of the temple makes perfect sense. We still do it. You know, we invite poet laureates to inaugurations and significant national events, and it's completely in line with what we would expect. So that's not so much of a surprise in this particular psalm. But there are a few problematic observations that I would make between the title of this psalm and the content of the psalm altogether. And you kind of track with me to see if they're a problem for you like they were for me. So um, first of all, David says absolutely nothing about the actual temple in the psalm. Did you pick that up? Not a word. Nothing about its magnificent stones, nothing about its lofty walls, nothing about its glorious spires, nothing. There's, There's not a single mention of the temple itself in the psalm, which is a little weird for a psalm that is written for the dedication of the temple. In addition, the dedication of the temple kind of symbolized the establishment of David's kingdom. And so this temple would have been kind of that patriotic raw, raw point. But there is no tone of we're number one, hey, we're number one, hey, going on in this temple. No, we will, we will rock you kind of theme. No, we are the champions of the world kind of tone. It's just kind of very subdued. There's very little patriotism there. No rockets, red glare, no bombs bursting in midair, nothing like that in this particular psalm. You kind of expect that at an event of this magnitude. But perhaps the strangest thing about this psalm is David actually never saw the temple. The temple was not built in David's lifetime. It was built 14-ish years after he died. So what we have going on here is we have David writing a psalm for the dedication of a temple that he's never going to see. So those technical problems kind of caused some issues for me. I had to figure out, okay, what is going on here in connection with the title and the text? itself. And I don't know that I cracked the code. I probably didn't. But I'm going to suggest something here that I think makes sense from what we read. And I'll let you be the judge when we come to the end of our 30 minutes together or so, whether um, I made some connections. I'm going to suggest that David was memorializing in this psalm why the temple was such a big deal to him. And it was a big deal to him, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But David is expressing why he's dedicated so much of his life, so much of his energy to a temple that represented something to him, but a temple which he would never with his own two eyes see. And as I started to think about that connection, a couple of other questions popped into mind that'll kind of be the the frame that we'll use to work through what we read in this psalm. So, Why was David motivated, so motivated to dedicate so much of his life to this particular expression, this particular building? What was was going on there? And how did that motivation translate into action, particularly action in relationship to the temple itself? Because it's dedicated to the temple. And then why did the temple have such a huge hold on David's heart and mind. And the more I thought about those questions, the more kind of this um, main point percolated up, and I'll run it by you, see what you think, and see if I can make my case by the time we get done here. Uh, The main point is that this is a love psalm. This is a psalm about what David loves. And I'm suggesting to you that what we love drives what we do and affirms what we believe. What we love drives what we do and affirms what we believe. And with that connective tissue in play, or that that foundation in place, I I think I can build a strong case through looking at what David loved, what that love prompted him to do, and what he believed that lay underneath the love that he demonstrated. So let's kind of dive into it from that vantage point. Okay, first of all, what did David love? Well, the plain and simple answer is the Lord. 31 times in 12 verses, David, either by use of his personal name, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, translated all caps in English translations, and the words you and your, 31 times in 12 verses, David makes reference to the Lord. That's kind of the way you talk about somebody you love. Their name is always on your lips. 
not far from your thoughts. But the question is, why does David love the Lord? And I think the answer is seen in what I would call a double deliverance, so to speak. First, in verses 1 through 3, a deliverance from external threats. So so let me just rehearse it for you. He says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Catch that there? Foes, external threats. And then, O Lord my God, verse 2, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. While not stated explicitly, apparently, There was a season in David's life where he was sick, injured, and he needed help from the Lord, and he sought the Lord. Verse 3, external threat. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol, which is the Old Testament word for grave or Hades or hell or that concept, the place where dead people go. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. So external threats that faced David. Foes threatened, sickness threatened, situations threatened, and the Lord drew him up like water from a well. When it seemed like his enemies were getting the upper hand, suddenly they didn't have it. When it seemed like illness was going to win and prevail, the Lord healed him. When it seemed like he was staring death in the face, the Lord brought him back to life. When someone does that kind of thing for you in your life with that kind of consistency, it draws something out of you. When the Lord does that to somebody, it prompts and provokes that somebody to love him. And that's exactly how David responded. He responded as somebody who realized, oh my goodness, I have been loved in a ridiculous kind of way, and I cannot help but love in return. And so David's heartfelt expression, I will extol you, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. I will give thanks to your holy name. This is exactly how people talk to people whom they love. But there was another deliverance that gets picked up in this psalm too, and we see that starting up in verse 6. Just track with me here. As for me, David said, I said in my prosperity, ha, I shall never be moved. By your favor, Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. And then there's a bit of a pause there, and just a little phrase, you hid your face, and I was wrecked. I was dismayed. This is not just mildly sad, it was, I was undone. I didn't know what to do. In fact, you see it expressed in the next few verses. To you, O Lord, I cry. To the Lord, I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? The answer is none. What, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? The answer is no. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You follow what's going on here? As David looks back over his life, recounts what's happening, following these harrowing deliverance from external threats, David's life finally got on that level plane where it's like, okay, I'm at the top of my game now. I'm secure in my kingdom, enjoying a little bit prosperity, not living week to week, month to month, and I am ready to praise God as the reason for that happening. I mean, picture it. If you'd been in David's place prior to being uh, king, It would be real easy for you to come to the conclusion, having gone through all of that, okay, finally, I am not going to be moved from here. I mean, he got the promotion, he got the new house, he got the babes, he was kicking Philistine butt all over Palestine. Life was really good for David. Here's the interesting thing. What does the Lord do at that particular time? He hides his face and David's life implodes. It collapses in on itself. We don't know for sure what that was in his actual experience, but it certainly sounds like it could be that episode of his life involving Bathsheba and Uriah and all the nasty consequences that followed when David decided to take matters into his own hands. Ironically, David finds himself in the same kind of emotional distress after these internal failures as he did when he was facing external threats. He's crying to the Lord for mercy, not because of illness, but because of his own sin. He's staring over the edge of the pit at the brink of death, not because of enemies chasing him, 
but because of his own folly. His loud and public praise is at risk of being trampled, in, trampled into the dust, not because of external threats, but because of moral failure on a catastrophic level. And just when it seems everything is lost, the Lord unhides his face, and David's mourning is turned into dancing. The sackcloth of death is replaced with the gladness of life. When somebody loves you like that, it evokes from you a love in return. And I'm suggesting to you that that, that's what David's telling us here. Let me just pause for a second. What David describes here about himself and the Lord and these experiences of his life, I'm going to suggest to you that that's basically the pattern of everybody's life who is a follower of Jesus Christ. You are in the process right now of a double deliverance. There has been a time in your life where you have been rescued from the external threat of perishing. You see, a Christian is one who became aware of their dreadful eternal plight, their sin and their sins, and they found the Lord gracious to save them, even though they knew they didn't deserve it. They did what John talks about when he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever trusts in him shall not perish. And in that desperate situation they found themselves, they clung to that and they enjoyed forgiveness. That critical juncture, they looked again at the Lord's kindness. But then, there's a deliverance from this creeping futility that pervades our world. You see, here's the problem. You, you, you come to the Lord, you get, as we call, saved, you're forgiven, you rest in that, and then you get yourself up, kind of, you know, brush yourself off saying, I am so glad that's over with. Now, it's all going to be cool. And we don't even realize it's not going to be cool. Because we still live in the broken condition we were found in. We're rescued, yes. We're forgiven, yes. But we forget that the consequences from which we were rescued and the sins for which we were forgiven were our own doing. We were children of disobedience for whom the wrath of God was being stored up. And in this second kind of rescue that David describes. He's describing what the Lord does in our life when he begins to reform our way of being, our way of living, now that we are forgiven. See, forgiveness exposes a common flaw in our thinking. We imagine that if we can just get our debt paid off, then we can live this good life right out into the horizon of happily ever after. We completely miss the fact that our forgiven debt was exactly the consequences of the way we had been living, the way we had been being in the world. It wasn't just some lemony snicket series of unfortunate events. It was our fault. We were the criminals whose crimes deserved the conviction we received. When we lived amongst them, we lived exactly like them. When we were in Rome, we did as the Roman did. And just because we got out of jail doesn't mean we were no longer criminals. It just means we got out of jail. And like David, we're tempted to say in our prosperity of forgiveness, well, now I'll never be moved. We're even willing to, you know, throw the Lord a bone and say, yeah, he's the one who made that possible, but... I got it from here. And it's right at this juncture in your life and mine. And if it hasn't happened yet, it will. But it's probably happening right now in multiple lives in the room. Right at this critical juncture, the Lord does the simplest and most brilliant thing he can do. He hides his face from us. He just lets us toddle. He doesn't stop us from behaving as we once did. And you know what happens? The same thing that always happened. But it's different this time. You see, the last time when our mistakes got us into our consequences, we looked for fig leaves. And we tried to sew them together. Tried to cosmeticize the whole problem. So that, well, I'm, just, I'm not as bad as everybody else. 
But this time we're like David. Man, we are undone. The true depth of what we have been rescued from has become painfully apparent to us, and we are dismayed. The Lord hid his face, and I was dismayed, David says. It's an entirely different response. But it's the response of love. Though we have been rescued from the pit, we realize that the stink of the pit still clings to every fiber of us. Though we've been drawn up, we become aware that our entire way of living is still coated with the dust of death. We're more like the dying than the living still, but thank God we're alive. We're more like the foes we fled from than the forgiven we were rescued to be. And it's a pattern with the saints that those upon whom the light of joy dawns often afterwards experience the sackcloth of mourning. They're alive, but their breath still stinks like death. It's what C.S. Lewis calls God's intolerable compliment to us. His compliment to all those who love him, having set his love upon us, the Lord will not let us remain where we were when he found us. He will scrub and clean. He will break and mend. He will squeeze and mold our entire life long, relentlessly striving to make us just a little bit more like Jesus than we ever, more, ever were. And that much more like we shall be when we see him at last. Because that's what love does. And David got it. What did he love? He loved the Lord. Why did he love him? Because the Lord has rescued me. And he has rescued me again. And I have no place I can turn but him. Now, that kind of love does something internally. When you know you have been loved like that, it changes the way you look at and go into the rest of your life. So our next question is, what did David's love drive him to do? And again, the answer is simple. It drove him to build the temple. But in order to appreciate that, we've got to kind of think about what the temple meant to David and what he did in his preparation for it. And so we can look at David's own words to understand what he thought or what the temple meant to him. For instance, in Psalm 27, he says, One thing do I ask of the Lord, one thing do I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's intense. I mean, can you reduce your life to the one thing? This is my one thing. And for David... I just want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to inquire in his temple. Pretty important place. If it's connected to your one thing. In Psalm 122, he indicates that visiting the temple was his happy place. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why? Well, because in Psalm 11, he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. (laughs) Why do I want to go to the house of the Lord? That's where the Lord is. Makes perfect sense. If you remember when you were dating, that's why you wanted to go to your spouse's, boyfriend's, girlfriend's house, because they were there. Not because the house was so nice. Man, I just love your house. I can do without you, but I like the house you've got. (laughs) That just doesn't enter our minds. We went to the house because the person we loved was there. And that's what David is, is saying here. He wants to go to the house of the Lord because the Lord lives there. It's there that my help comes from in Psalm 20, verse 4. It's there where he hears the cries of those who cry to him. Why would someone who loves the Lord not want to go to the house of the Lord? In fact, he says elsewhere, Psalm 5, verse 7, that those who worship the Lord do so bowing down toward his holy temple. And then in the temple, everyone cries glory, according to Psalm 29, verse 9. In other words, the temple is the focal point of his deepest joy, That's where the glory dwells that completes the deepest desires of his life. A life that David describes as being shepherded by the Lord's goodness and mercy with the high hope 
that when all is said and done, he shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you take all those references and look them up and look at the title in every one of them, they will all start a psalm of David. So we are literally quoting David on what the temple means to him. So we're starting to get an understanding of what that love for the Lord prompted David to do. He, he wanted to build a temple because that's where the Lord was. He longed, like his forefathers who built altars of stone in response to the Lord appearing to them, he longs to build a temple so that he can always be near, always be with, always be around the Lord whom he loves. That's how it is when you love someone. You just want to be around them, always. But that's not it. I mean, well, that's just Bible talk. You know, those Bible people, they were just religious, kind of a little fanatical, but they're just, just Bible talk. Okay. We've got to look next at what David invested in the temple then. Because he actually put his money where his mouth was. In First Chronicles, towards the end, there are seven chapters devoted to what David invested in the temple. Let me, let me just read some of them. They'll be up on the screen in back of you. So along with cutting all the stones that would be needed for the temple, a temple which he would never walk into and would never see in his lifetime. He is not going to benefit one bit from what we read here. But that didn't stop him from doing what we read here. That's the point. Along with the stones, David provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors and for the gates and for clamps, as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing and cedar timbers without number. A little bit later on in the same chapter, he says to Solomon, with great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, a million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there's so much of it. Timber and stone, too, I have provided. To these, you must add. In other words, all of this wealth that I have provided for the temple, it's not quite enough. Solomon, when you get an extra dime, when you get an extra dollar, you got to add to what I added. And lest we think this was some small contribution, let me remind you that its talent is 75 pounds. So David is saying here, I have provided 7.5 million pounds of gold for the temple. I just checked into, you know, so what's gold selling for an ounce? As of Friday this week, $2,397 per ounce. That means just with gold alone, David had laid up $287.7 billion dollars worth of gold just to be smeared on the walls and doors of this temple he would never step into. A million talents of silver, 75 million pounds of silver. Now, silver is a little cheaper than gold, trading at about $34 an ounce as of Friday this past week, which translates into $2.4 billion as of the end of week. So we're getting close to $300 billion dollars worth of just silver and gold, not to mention iron that can't be weighed, bronze that can't be weighed, timbers that can't be counted, stone that, how do you even, and not even that is enough. And then the rest of the chapters in Second and First Chronicles chapter, uh, at the end of the First Chronicles are about how David organized the Levites, how he organized the priests, how he arranged for the musicians, how he structured the administrative structure. He even had the architectural drawings drafted up for what the temple would look like. A temple, mind you, that he was never going to step inside of. Sounds like the kind of thing that people who love something would do, doesn't it? Investing thousands of hours, billions of dollars, tens of thousands of man hours and woman hours, and tireless energy into a temple that was yet to be built. So some might say, well, pff, that's probably a little over the top. You know, a little bit crazy. David got a little fanatical there. Really? Is there actually a limit? 
or price tag or cost that's too much for love? Really? We should be a little cautious here because if you're tracking with what I'm saying, it should be evoking a memory of an event in Jesus' life where he visited some friend's house where two sisters lived, sisters whom he loved dearly and who loved him equally dearly. And sometime during the dinner, one of the sisters slipped out of the room and came back in carrying a vase, a a bottle of ointment that we're told in today's dollars would be worth tens of thousands of dollars. And she just wantonly broke it and poured it all over Jesus and began to anoint his feet. And everybody in the room was incensed by the waste. What just happened here? This money should have, this perfume should have been sold. We could have fed so many poor people with that. And the only one who didn't rebuke her was Jesus, who actually rebuked the people who called what she did a waste. And in fact, he took it a step further and he said, listen, wherever the stories about me shall be told, this story about her and her love will also be told. For she has done a beautiful thing to me. And it will not be taken away. That's what love prompts you to do. It prompts you to build extravagant temples. It prompts you to, quote, waste valuable possessions. It challenges us to ask ourselves whether we spend way too much fritter and fuss on petty things like sex and money and achievements or any number of lesser things. People who go all in on loving Jesus testify that they believe something different, something more powerful than those who don't. And perhaps our problem is that we love far less than we can, far less than we should, and we squander our lives on things that will never satisfy while missing the one who can. So what was it that David believed that this love he had so affirmed I'm going to suggest there are two things, actually. The first is that there's something more than the current moment that matters most of all. David believed, I'm going to build this temple because I love the Lord, and I know there's something more than this current moment that matters most of all. Two times in the psalm, he recounts moments when he was pressed to the point of death and despair. The one's from external force, the other from internal fumbles. And in both of them, he acknowledges that the Lord delivered him. In other words, anger stung for its moment. But favor prevailed for a lifetime. There was a weeping in those moments which must have felt like an endless night, but joy followed like the rising sun. Personal failures load life up with grief and despair that is sometimes harder than we think we can bear. And then the Lord stops hiding his face and mourning is turned into dancing. The sackcloth of death gets exchanged for the white robes of gladness. David's love for the Lord drove him to build a temple so that every time the moments of his life turned dark and bleak, He and everyone else for whom life took those turns could remember that the Lord is in his holy temple. And the current moment shall not have the final word. The darkness, the anger, the sickness will not prevail in the end. He was convinced that in spite of the moment, Favor and joy and dancing and gladness were the internal and eternal inheritance of the people of God. And this magnificent temple of which he spoke so highly and to which he contributed so lavishly was merely a footstool reminder of a king and a kingdom beyond compare. But he believed more than that, not just that the current moment is not the final word, but he believed that something beyond the temple was even better yet. You may remember the story, the whole temple and David. He was the one who came up with the idea. 
He had had this win, winning streak, come into his kingdom, established Jerusalem as the new capital, built himself this lovely palace, and one day it struck him, man, this just isn't right. Here I am living in this palatial place, and God is living in a tent. Called up one of his prophets, said, prophet, come on in here, I've got, I got a proposal for you. He said, I want to build the Lord a big house. The prophet said, whoa, good idea. The Lord bless you, David. And that night the prophet went home and the Lord showed up in a vision and told him, you're going to have to go back to David and say, he's not the man that's going to build me a temple. I'm not going to take a temple from him. The Lord said, not only have I never asked for a nice new house, but David's a bloody man. And if there's going to be a house built for my kingdom, it will not be built by a man whose legacy is bloodshed and vengeance. It will be built by a king whose legacy is peace and justice. And then in a surprising turn, the Lord told David that he, the Lord, would build David a house. Now here's a really interesting thing. In Psalm, or excuse me, first, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where this little dialogue is playing out, the same word translated house in 2 Samuel 7 is translated temple in the title of this particular psalm. So the Lord completely turns the table. You wanted to build me something, David? Let me tell you something. I am going to build you something. And I'm going to do it through a son who's born from your line. He is going to be a son who knows his father's favor. And he will be the son to build the temple to the Lord. And his kingdom will be something like David's kingdom, but more than just his kingdom, a kingdom that will never end. And so that somehow every hope of future blessedness would be realized in him. And everybody thought, okay, who is that going to be? And they thought for sure it had to be Solomon. He was wise, he was peaceful, he was just. Just read the record. But then you read a little bit farther in the record and you realize, well, he's not all that different from David. Just a sinner of another sort. So there had to be something more than the temple. There had to be something more than that particular son. And at this point in time, it only makes sense to introduce you to the true son, whose name was Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the city of David, because he was of the house and lineage of David. The same Jesus who three times in his life heard the Father say something like, you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. The same Jesus who as a 12-year-old lad felt he had to be in his father's house, even though everybody else had headed home. The same Jesus as an angry 30-year-old stormed into the temple driving out what had become a farmer's market instead of a house of worship for the zeal of the house of the Lord. The same Jesus who a few months later, when contesting with the Pharisees, said, referring to himself, and something greater than the temple is here. The book of Hebrews identifies Jesus as the better high priest of that temple who brought before the Lord a better sacrifice in that temple, specifically his own blood, and in doing so provided a once-for-all atonement that could never be undone, the proof of which was when he yielded up his life on the cross. The veil that separated humanity from holiness was torn from top to bottom. Right now, this wonderful thing called the church, this same Jesus, is building into a house, which Peter says is made up of living stones, referring to all us all, and which Paul calls the temple of God. In less time than we can imagine, Jesus himself will finish this work of building that temple and will return to inhabit it and will inaugurate the kingdom that will never end. It's to the point where the entirety of human history from the beginning up until that moment will be seen for what it truly is, just that moment of his anger that is replaced by the life of his favor, a life that never ends. The darkness that overcasts every life 
since Adam and Eve, including yours and mine, that darkness will give way to the light of joy, which shall never grow dark again. He, Jesus, will turn our mourning into dancing on that day. The same Jesus will exchange the sackcloth we call flesh and bone with new clothes that will always fit and will always feel like gladness. Of course, David couldn't see these things. They were too far away from him. But he saw enough to believe that there was something beyond the temple that was even better yet. And if David could believe that from his vantage point, how much more should we from ours? So there it is. If I've done my job, you can see something of the connection between the poetry David penned and the temple to which the poetry was dedicated. Or you can affirm with me on a more universal level that what we love does indeed drive what we do and affirm what we believe. Which leaves us with a final question. What are we to do with all of this? Well, I think David gives us an answer, just not in this particular psalm. He does so in Psalm 2, so receive this exhortation from David. Now, therefore, he says, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is not only an exhortation from David, brothers and sisters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Thank you for this good word, our Father. We knew, we knew that there was love like this. And we spend so much of our finite life chasing after it in all the wrong alleys and wrong places. May you, through the preaching of your word, through the love of the Spirit, help us to see that it is only in going all in on our love for Jesus that we can ever understand truly what it is to know joy and gladness and life. We pray that in his name. Amen.